this is what they do. Right, now you want to be glad and joy. That's true. So it's the same process. I was a lawyer, so maybe they do it in She made me. She said it looked like I was sucking up too much. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I wanted to sit there, but too much on the film. How are you? Thank God. Thank you. Pass these around. Oh, that's right. You know, I saw that. It's just a plain one. Yes, I took it, and I think I have it. In my office, I apologize. Can you, can you manage that today? Yeah. After the class, remind me. Oh, we'll get it. I, we do have it. It was good notes in there. It looked very detailed. I liked it. It explains to me why so many Jewish people become lawyers because we can take a sentence and interpret it in different ways. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. You don't have to agree with anything. Does anyone need the uh, text before we begin? Has everybody got the... There you go. And pass a few... Oh! See, did I bring in... Uh, I brought in from another class. I apologize. This isn't what the text you No, I have the wrong piece here. Here you go. This is, this is our class. Hi there. You're not here? You know, could you share with somebody? I, I'm Maya's out of town. I'm all upside down. I don't have the right papers here. Thanks. Thanks. Oh. If you come back to the office with me afterwards, I'll get everybody. Maya's out of town. I got some from the Kabbalah class. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm not sure I said that, no, but I think everyone can benefit from it. Did I, did I say something along those lines? I thought you said you don't have to be Jewish to, um, to um, not just to study this, yeah. but um, what's in here, what we believe, um, it, it still pertains to non-Jews, too. I think there's a lot to learn from it. Certainly the text is directed to the Jewish community, but... I think anyone has a lot to learn from it for sure. And, and at Temple, everybody's welcome in every activity class, so there's no question here. Yeah. Yeah. But what happens to the soul after death has nothing to do with your religion, correct? Well, that's where they go. There's nuances. Each, each soul path has, has a different pathway, but let's, we're getting off topic of this. We'll talk after about that. that that's all complex questions. How's everybody? What are we at? How many people are here today right now? 19? Feels bigger. Feels bigger. Feels like 30. So it feels like. <laughs> it's all right. No. So, welcome everybody. How are you? Everybody's good? Good. 
Any burning questions before we uh, dive in? Yeah? Yes, I'll do my best to start us from the beginning each time so we kind of get our bearings. Yeah. Yeah? Sorry, I, uh, that's a good question, but I mean questions on the text. We, I don't think we were having reincarnation just yet. So we can answer that Are after. Are talking about um, um, uh, Russia and, and Yeah, yeah. Sadiq. So when, when a soul, when they yeah. Sadiq, is it because they've gone the level? So become a Sadiq is something that happens while you're alive. It's a status that you get by, by either being born with that quality, or certainly a few people have worked and gone from being a Rasha to a Bani to a Tzaddik, perhaps. Uh, that's something that happens when you're alive. What happens afterwards, uh, what happens after you die, the soul does keep elevating and enjoying the light of the work that it did in the world, but the soul cannot change levels after it's in a body. Once it's out of a body, now it's static, as it were, at its level, but it's, it's elevating if it's a tzaddik in terms of enjoying divine light, if you know what I mean. The elevations during the alive period, not the soul. Yeah, the change, the progress from one status to another, perhaps, can only happen now. So this is, this is the moment, this is the time. While we're in a body, once we're out of the body, we may be at a, a new level, hopefully, but now we look back and we say, oh, I wish I had worked harder, right? Because this is the chance, this is, this is the, the portal where that walking forward happens for a soul. Yeah. Welcome back. So we started uh, with a quote from the Torah, which says, Ki devar me'od la'asoto. The thing is very close to us all, in our mouth and our hearts, to do it. And the Alter Rebbe says that's counterintuitive. Is it really that easy to do the Torah with your heart, with joy? So big question and then raises a number of other questions uh, in the first chapter. The first being this conflict between two quotes. One piece of Torah that says our soul, before it comes into a body, is given a, uh, a vow, made to take a vow, to try and be a tzaddik and not be a Russia, but no matter what the world says, consider itself like a Russia. It says, what's this? Bless you. It also says, don't think of yourself as a Russia. Don't it be a Russia in your eyes. Right, so which one is correct? And then he goes through other questions. We have to serve God with joy. How can we serve God with joy if we think of ourselves as a Russia? And he says, we'll understand better if we don't think of just Russia and Sadiq. But in fact, see, there's five types, also from the Talmud. Right? A complete Russia, incomplete Russia, Bainani. Uh, incomplete tzaddik and a tzaddik, five types, and several different ways to define them. And then he gives us a few hints as to what a baini is. Right? First of all, he tells us, don't think of a rasha as a horrible, awful person. A rasha is also someone who is very, very refined, but just has a little shred of egocentric activity once in a while, and they're still a rasha. So rasha is a very wide spectrum of people. And then he also says, a Russia is judged by their evil nature, a tzaddik is judged by their good nature, and a Bainani is judged by both. And we'll get into that later as well. And finally he says, a tzaddik has voided their heart within them. So a tzaddik is defined not so much by their, just their behavior, of course their behavior, but what distinguishes a tzaddik from a Bainani perhaps is that a tzaddik has voided their heart within them. They've emptied out that potential, that possibility, for doing anything counterproductive. The behavior of a Bainanite tzaddik, it seems, is probably exactly the same, but the difference is an internal one. That a Bainanite may still have that potential to come up with a, a, a problematic suggestion, just in their sort of reflexive heart and their emotions, but they're not going to think, talk, or act about it, just like a tzaddik. A tzaddik has voided that. A tzaddik doesn't need any discretion because every instinct they have is productive, is helpful. Yeah? 
And then he says, but really, if you want to understand it, you need to know what it says, I believe in the Zohar, that every person has two souls. So there's, there's a, a bit of an argument going on within each of us between these two souls, and that's why there's this tension. That's why we seem to have a lot of uh, 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 contradictions within ourselves. And the first soul that we learned about is actually comes out of what we call the klipa and the sitra achra. Klipa and sitra achra kind of means the same thing, subtle difference. You can review the class if you want to hear the differences. Good morning, how are you doing? Good to see you. Hey, hey. <laughs> Basically, it's the other side of creation. In creation, there's ein sof, and it's light entering into creation in various ways, and it's all unified, it's all one. And then there's anything else that thinks it exists. Anything else that thinks it exists that doesn't realize it's part of this one light that's coming from this infinite Ein Sof, that's the other side, or that's the shell that's around life, right? If I get a letter from someone and I give it to my kids and they say, oh, I got a letter, they're looking at it and they're playing with it and they're reading the outside, so you have to open the letter. That's the envelope you're looking at. And if they're really young and don't understand, they might think that's all there is, it's just a letter. And they're looking at the envelope, I'm like, no. Open the envelope, take it outside, there's a person who wrote you a message. There's something inside the letter. So if we just look at life as externals, all we're looking at is the letter, the envelope rather. But every experience, every thing around us, every person in our life, every phenomenon in our life has a shell. And that shell is just the exterior envelope. And we have to learn to open up that envelope put it on the desk, open up the letter and read it and get to the inside of what everything is in our life to express and to have us learn. Hey, good morning. That's the klipa. So the author Rebbe is encouraging us to recognize we have one soul that basically is just external. And we learned also that from a Jewish perspective, that soul has a little bit of light mixed in. It's from what's called klipa noga, the translucent klipa. Right? We'll get more onto that later. And then, in chapter 2, we started learning about our second soul. That is what's called the divine soul, Nefesh Elokit. And if Nefesh Bamit flows in this direction, towards myself, Nefesh Elokit flows in the opposite direction, towards those around me, extending, helping, and as well, wanting to unify with God. Wanting to rise up and experience that total oneness of being, as it were, a ray of light within the ball of the sun, having no identity whatsoever. That's the impulse of Nefesh, nefesh Elokit. Yeah, and if we get to uh, the beginning of chapter 2, that part of our soul is un actually, literally, a part of God above. We shouldn't think of it as, as really even a self, because it has no self. It's a part of God. It's a part of oneness. And the first metaphor he uses to explain it is that God spoke all of creation into being in Breshit through speech. But when it came to creating Adam and Eve, God blew. God blew the soul into them. And the author had pointed out, when we speak, it comes from a more superficial level. It takes less energy. I can speak for a long time without becoming tired. If I had to blow up balloons all day, blow, 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 I'd need breaks because I would get tired, pulled from deeper within me. So when God created the nefesh elokit of each of us, God blew from deeper within the Ein Sof. It's something that's actually a part of God. Yeah? Is our streaming is an issue? Okay, thanks, thanks. And then the author ever brings in a beautiful two-part metaphor, which has to do with uh, procreation, which has to do with, with how parents give birth to children. And he says two aspects. On the one hand, Jewish souls arose in divine thought. On the other hand, every Jew is like the firstborn child of, of a parent, of God. Now these connect beautifully in ancient, uh, or, or earlier rather, medical outlook, because they did really get at the time, they felt that there was a spiritual fluid in the brain that somehow developed through the spinal cord into this physical substance that actually became the semen and, and, and went out and made the baby. 
So for them, it was a direct thing. There was a, a part of the brain that emitted a sort of non-physical fluid that developed into a physical fluid. And uh, we read a quote from Rabbi Steinzeltz, Steinzeltz, who described maybe in more contemporary terms, that we, even from our perspective, there's a cascade from the spiritual, from my love for my partner, from my intention to uh, have children, uh, from my, my thoughts and sensations that flow down through my nervous and chemical system and wind up eventually becoming what's emitted. And so whether you look at it modern or uh, older medicine, somehow there's a cause and effect that goes from spiritual to physical, that comes from the brain through the spine and starts the procreative uh, cascade. Right? So whichever way you want to look at it, something happens in the brain that comes from the soul that eventually becomes that drop that's emitted that starts becoming the child within, within a woman. Yeah, so that's the one aspect. That's the second aspect. And then he develops these two pieces to show us something about uh, Jews as a whole. And that is that on the one hand, like the first impulse that starts the cascade of procreation, every Jew is connected to and first arose in God's chokhmah. Right? Every Jew comes from that first spark of God's wisdom. And he goes on to say, God's wisdom isn't like our wisdom. With God, the knowledge, knower, and known are all the same. And so if we arose in God's wisdom, then we were never separate from God's wisdom. When God knows that spark of our soul, God is the knowledge, the knower, and the known. God is that spark of the soul, and we're still unified with God as that spark that we developed out of, each one of us has never separated from God at our source, at our root. But the second half of the mushal, of the metaphor, shows us why there's so many different levels of souls, why some of us can't seem to see godliness in life very easily or at all, why some of us are very learned and profound and some of us perhaps less learned or more irreverent. And by that, he uses the metaphor of the physical baby being developed. Because that, that first zygote in a mother, that's just this one cell that's almost pure uh, potential. It, it's so much like uh, the essence that comes from the father and the essence of the mother. But eventually it divides and divides and divides. And first you see central organs, a brain and a heart. And then eventually you see more external organs. And finally by the end you're getting nails and a little bit of hair and all the very external parts. And same thing with the Jewish people that spark that arose in God's mind developed as it became the one person that is all Jews, right? 14 million bodies, but one, one Jew. That's how Jewish mysticism sees the Jewish people. There's not a bunch of us here. There's just, we're just, you know, now 20 something uh, uh, sparks of this one body, 20 something cells of this 14 million cell body, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> and, each way, and as we develop, some of us actually come down all the way down to the bottom. We've developed all the way through gestation until we become almost nails or hair. We're less sensitive, perhaps. Some of us actually only uh, travel down, as it were, until the point of the brain or the heart. And some of us, and you may have met ever a Jew who seemed just outside of this world, experience the world from the point of view of that initial spark. They're, they're, their consciousness is still back up in one of the higher worlds, which we'll learn about today. But they're still flowing through a body. The body's still there. You can talk to them. They'll walk around. They'll do stuff like you. But they're, they're functioning at the level of a brain, almost, in this one being. How does he know it's Jew? <coughs> the spark? How does it get to be? That, you know, that's, it's, uh, you know if, if you accept that we uh, encounter something at Sinai, Right? And if you accept that that was God and that we were all there, then that's, for the Alter Rebbe, that's the axiomatic starting point. Right? So, so for the Alter Rebbe, because God came to his soul and said to him, I'm God, you're a Jewish person, here's your Jewish soul, now, now go fix the world. Right? So if you accept that, you accept it. If you don't accept it... No, but I mean for the rest, I mean that everybody is at Sinai. Yeah, yeah. Oh, all Jews. Yeah, because yeah, we're all at Sinai, right? Yeah, Just, I am perhaps, you know, I, I'm a nail on, on the toe, so I don't remember it, but I'm part of a body that remembers it, right? So the, the nail on my finger doesn't remember what I did yesterday, 
If you clip this nail off of me and then asked it, what did Candor Small ask you yesterday? What's it going to tell you? It's going to say, right, it's a nail. But it's me, right? And I know what I did yesterday, and I care about my nail, and my, my vitality goes from my brain to my nail and causes it to grow, and I even, you know, take care of them. So in that the nail is part of me, I know what I did yesterday, and so does every part of me, right? However, from the point of view of the nail, it has a different perspective. It just knows that it's bound up. It gets its life from, from the center. So that's like us. A Jew like me isn't going to be able to look back at Sinai and see the realities of the soul so clearly. But I'm part of this one body, and so when I recognize that, I can draw vitality and uh, have a different experience of some kind. But that is a universal God. Yes. Yeah. Jewish, the Israelite, whatever. Does that happen with other? It does. And that's a little off topic, but just very quickly, there's 70 pathways okay. for each of the 70 nations. And also, combined with that, each one of us has one little slice of the world for us to elevate, and that includes everything about the world. So nothing's outside of godliness. Everything's wrapped up in this flow. But, you know, that's getting us into other territory. Yeah? Good, very good. <laughs> Uh, so let's start on 57. All right, we've gone through these analogies to think nicely. Kimshal haben hanimshach mimoch av shafilu tsi parne raglav nithavu mitipa zomamash. The manner. Let me go this way if you want to read. Of the manner of the soul's descent is analogous to skin on my feet. All come from the same draw. But to have a complete baby, you need all those. Right? God forbid, I should have a baby without skin on its feet that has some condition. That's a big problem. You have to fix that. That baby's not going to walk around properly, right? So to be a baby, it needs the skin on its feet. And to be a complete human uh, Jewish phenomenon, the Jewish people needs the lowest aspects of its, its uh, organism as well. Right? They make it complete, and they need to serve their purpose for their organism
the one answer uh, Cindy gave is that, in fact, many people look at the mitzvahs as being ways for men to catch up. Right. Right? Why is it that women can pray on their own and men need to make them? Look at men and women. Men and women <laughs> create community naturally. Men will just go and sit in their room and, and, and pray on their own if they were left to their own devices. So men need to find a group of ten men, get together, pray together, have a little food after, eventually figure out that community happens, you can do it. Right? And many of the mitzvahs are there to, to bring men up to the level that I think women intuitively get. We're all connected. It is, isn't it? Ian calls it Odene Shura Mikhedet Yukud Nikula. For everything, and, and I think it's the nature of women. If I was a woman, I could answer better. How did yeah. God was that spark to say, Well, this is going to be a woman, so we'll give her a little more or a little elevated soul? Yeah, well, we say it's uh, divine providence. I mean, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I don't, I can't speak to the mechanics of it. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, when he made me. there you go. Happened when he made me, and every other, every other, yeah. וגם עכשיו בבן יניקת הציפרניים וחיותם נמשכת מהמוח שבראש. So he's really, he's really hammering this point because he wants to make sure we understand that there's many levels, right? And the level of the soul may change, 
But the source and root of the soul is the same, and we're all bound up with the source and root of the soul, and that's the father's brain in the metaphor, and in the analog for the metaphor, that's chokhmah of Ein Sof. That's the spark of wisdom of Ein Sof, which we're all still united with that. We're all just in that spark, in potential. That's all we are. And I bring some quotes. Yes, it is written in the Gemara, from the whitest cloudiest drop of the sea are formed the veins, the bones, and the nails of the child. According to Kabbalah, too, there is a connection between the nails and the brain, as shall be presently stated. I know. So we don't normally use this word. He uses it a few times. Here we go. We're almost done. But there's a connection between the white aspect and the white aspect Kabbalistically. That's cool. Right? And, and another, uh, another quote. Uchmosh ketub be'etz chayim shar ha'cha shmal. V'sod levushim shal adam harishon began eden. Ha'cha shmal, yeah. Shehayu tziparnai mibchinat moach tuna. I notice which faculty? The tuna part, right? For those who have gone further, that's that's the tuna aspect of, of the brain of bina, right? But uh, there, there's tradition says that uh, before Adam and Eve uh, ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they had this covering over their bodies. And once the, they ate from it, it shrank and was left just as nails. But initially, they had a nail covering over their whole body. And, and as I said, it, it came from their tvuna, from sort of an aspect of their cognition. So now we're going to get a little deeper. So in our, in our user's guide to the soul, we have this first basic uh, schematic picture of what a soul looks like in the abstract. And we said it's flowing up from our, for most of us, the vast majority, from our stable consciousness up through four spiritual worlds as it flows up towards where it emerges from the Ein Sof. Right? So here, that's where we're all a spark in our parents' brain. We're all uh, still uh, bound up with the Chokhmah of Ein Sof. As we come down, uh, some of us, a rare few emerge here in Atzilus. That's like Moshe, who just lived life from the perspective of godliness. A few others emerge in Bria, a few others in Yitzhira. Most of us emerge in Asiya and in the lowest aspects of Asiya. So now we're going to learn a little about what these four worlds are. Um, because even though my level may be down in Asiya, I still exist in all these worlds. And so although my conscious experience is in Asiya, by learning about the worlds, I can actually learn to still have impact in those worlds. My soul can function in those worlds, and I can create a lot of progress and do a lot of work in those worlds by all the tools we have in Kabbalah and in Judaism and here at Temple. Yeah, so we're going to learn a little about the nature of each of these worlds, a quick tour of them. So hold on to your hats. <laughs> Her wants the soul, the soul too. Uh, we'll go back, yeah. Right, so I know if you're listening on video, uh, it's hard to hear the room. So we're on the English on page 59 of this edition of Lessons in Tanya. And we're uh, about to learn about the four worlds. You can follow along in English. But just like a baby develops first its central aspects, its highest aspects, and then lower, lower, lower until finally you have the external, the same thing happens when a soul is uh, developing, is going through its gestation. Some of them wind up in this world, some of them travel further down. Uh, I want to go on, Joey, please. <coughs> the Alter Rebbe will now go on to state the details of this ascent. Specifically, the soul passes through four spiritual worlds in its ascent from supernal wisdom to the human body. 
these worlds or stages in the creative process are the descending order, Asilu, the world of emanation, Maria, the world of creation, Yetzia, the world of formation, and Asila, the world of action. They are written across acrostically. Acrostically as Abia. Abia. Abia, yeah. I've, I've, I've probably heard Abia too. I don't. I, I, you know, I read it more than I say it. That. So there's four spiritual worlds. As we said, they're not sci-fi worlds somewhere else where there's alternate universes with other other uh, you know world events happening. They're simply more and more energetic or refined or godly uh, manifestations of this world. So if you could if you could uh, travel inside to the spiritual chain and effect that's causing physical reality, you eventually get to each of these worlds, and each of them are subdivided into many, many other levels. So it's not a, a fixed, concrete world. It's really a, a category of many, many levels that the soul uh, travels through as it comes down. Question. Yeah? So these worlds we're talking about descent from the angels down. Uh, when, when the body dies, the soul ascends that's tricky. I mean, you know, because for instance, you hear about the uh, the Baal Shem Tov would do a sense of the soul, and great mystics would do a sense of the soul, where they would travel away from worldly consciousness and up and up and up, and they would encounter all kinds of beings. They would they would see that there was a you know a judgment about this community and figure out how to how to tweak what was going on in heaven, and they would change uh, realities by by being able to interact with heavenly uh, forces. So a soul can ascend apparently through practices and meditation from our normal state to higher states. Here we're talking about the soul being formed, so it's really the soul uh, developing. That's kind of a different phenomenon, how a soul develops versus a soul ascending. Um, also, a soul's normal state is one of fluctuation. So a soul's not stuck in one place. A healthy soul is always moving up and down, even in subtle ways or in larger ways. And for instance, during the year, on, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, my soul is in a higher state, as it were. On Shabbat, my soul is in a higher state. There's an access to Bria that's not there. So the soul is always flowing up and down in big and small ways. When, when we die, we disconnect from the bottom nefesh level of the soul that is connected to Asiya. So the soul disconnects from that and dislocates, and it's only here. But if I basically uh, am functioning in Yitzhira, then... My understanding is after I, after I die, when I'm a soul back in heaven, I'm, I'm a soul at the level of Yetzira there. It's so, I mean, but my question, again, to add to the question yeah. is, uh, you know, when you die and the soul, I mean, you know, I, mean I just learned last week, you know, that the, the author of you said, you know, I, I don't want you not Aiden, I just want you. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, basically want to bad, bypass that and just become one with God. Yes, so that is a very lofty uh, practice that he has, right? Where he says even even the spiritual realities and the and the light of Torah that I've created, you know, forget that stuff. That. I just want you. I just want you. Yeah. So there's there's no matter how lofty a phenomenon you're talking about, there's always more. And it's always possible to to travel closer, as it were, to the Ain Self because it's an infinite being. Right, but then you have to have all that pickle because then then you no longer exist. Yeah. Soul. Yeah. But for this purpose, we want to learn about the four worlds, yeah. and for that. We want to see the structure, and, and, and it's a big job to elevate a soul from one to the next, so. I, I'm having trouble Sorry, putting together the, the two souls. Yeah. So when you're saying the soul, yeah. you, are you talking about both? Yeah, it's the whole phenomenon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with the two souls, how does that mesh with Nefesh, Ruach, and Neshama? So every, both, both of them? each of the souls look like this, right? They all flow down from their source. Their sources are a little different and they, they wind up manifesting differently because the Nefesh Bamit, although it comes from very lofty sources underneath the throne of glory from the face of the ox, etc., and, and from the dregs of the Ophanim or, or the other angels, I, I forget, uh, it emerges out of Klippa. So its source is very lofty, but its level is just physical reality. It likes to eat, it likes to, uh, it likes to uh, earn money, right? So it has a different pathway coming down, but it's still it's, it's flowing through this whole system. It has all spiritual aspects. 
Likewise, of course, Nevesh Elokit is flowing directly like this and is more, much more uh, obviously uh, an actual piece of God, right? So you have, you have two souls, and they both have this whole structure just flowing in very different formats. At what point, uh, how does a person know at what point their soul is, and how do they get to the next level? By honest stock-taking, right? The question is, how does a person know what point their soul is, and how does it get to the next level? So the beginning of spiritual growth is having an honest look at myself and saying, okay, maybe I'd like to think I'm the best person in the world, wouldn't we all? But let me look at what I did this year and what I said and, 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 and what I thought about, and how can that be improved? And looking honestly at myself, I'd say, you know what? Most of the stuff I thought about, said, or did was this direction, was ego-centered, so good. I got work to do. Surprise, surprise. <coughs> If I can look back at my year and I can say, you know what, every thought I had was productive, everything I said was kind, every action I did was helpful, I don't have to now say I'm not a Russia, but I'm doing pretty well. You know, I've got only subtle things to refine. And if I'm the kind of person that really only sees the world as godliness, I'm probably not asking what level I'm on, right? As you get higher and higher, that, that question becomes less important. So generally, if I'm asking the question, it means I'm kind of still an egocentric person, and I do the normal work we all do. Yeah? <coughs> yeah, and also we have teachers, right? I mean, I, I work with Rabbi Label Wolf, and uh, you know, he sits me down, he says, our first conversation, he said, what's the three most problematic things that happen in your life that you contribute to the world? And that was Kabbalah. We're working on whatever it may be, you know, my three most triggering uh, interactions or my three most problematic qualities and trying to refine my qualities emotionally, interactively. Right? So you do this work and you just keep working and trying to improve and each person at their level. But no, nobody can definitively say, Chad, you're at the lowest level and you've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Look, if I, if I go to a, a teacher and I say, you know, I want to learn from you, help me, help me develop, uh, you know, just say it like it is. Now it's that person's responsibility, to be honest. And if I'm at that level, they say, here you are, you're just starting out. You, you spent 40 years or 45 years going in this direction. Now we want you to start going in this direction. It may feel strange at first because you're just starting, but here's your first step. So yeah, if I go to a, a teacher or a mashpia, it's their responsibility to try and be honest about what they perceive. And I may be at the lowest level much of the Jewish world is at the lowest level. That's, that's the most common state. Well, you do a lot of good work. Uh, at what <coughs> level would you put yourself in today? Uh, very, ordina very ordinary Russia. I'm a very ordinary Russia. Yeah. No, it's, it's, no, it's just, it's, it's clear, okay? Okay, back to the text. <laughs> so the function and significance. And go on, it's yours. All right, so we're talking about Atsilus. This is the highest of the four spiritual worlds. And Atsilus is a very strange world because it's not, it's barely a world. It's just godliness, right? It comes from, uh, well, we'll hear the word it comes from. But this is just emanations of godliness. If, if God could have a light that was not even separate from godliness yet, that wasn't even, even uh, its own identity, that's what this world is, right? We have yet to encounter anything that can exist independently. So there's no concept of being. It's just nothingness. Right? So for those of you who meditated, and when you look within yourself, and you get to this point where there's just this nothingness, and the East, they just stick with that, and that creates certain results. The reason it's nothingness is because above our consciousness, in Atsilus, there are no things. There's no concept of a thing. Right? So to have access to Atsilus, you have to not be a thing. That's why it looks like nothing. We can't even identify with it because everything, every, uh, every realization we have is from the perspective that we exist, that we're a thing. 
That's the beginning of our consciousness. There's some kind of I. And that doesn't exist in Atsilus. Atsilus is just godliness. You look like you've never heard this before. No, no. <laughs> yeah. So a little more about Atsilus. The two, these two. Right, so two, two definitions or two uh, ways that the root is used. One is uh, being near. So the world of Atsilus is just godliness. It's near to God. It's godliness itself. And the second is to delegate. From when uh, Moshe delegated sort of holiness onto the elders of our people. And so there was an extension that came from Moshe that was still part of Moshe, it was just sort of, it was extended onto, it was delegated onto the other elders. Yeah. So this world is something where God extends godliness into this world, but it's not separate. God hasn't created anything yet. It's still just godliness. Very difficult to understand this world. It's above our comprehension, totally. Yeah. So go a little further down. We may start to recognize uh, some concepts here. The world of Bria. Right, so we need to start to get comfortable with the nuances of states of consciousness or states of reality because Kabbalah is very specific and when we say something is now not nothing doesn't mean it's something right oh wait hold are you are you something or are you just not nothing yet anymore right because that's a different that's a difference <coughs> so passing from Atsilus to Bria passing through this uh, this curtain as it were now it's the first moment where there's not just nothingness. It's not just incomprehensibility. It's not just, I'm, I'm a being. How can I even understand something that doesn't have any beingness? I need to have a thing to focus on to recognize anything. So it's here, it's just, just nothingness. It's emptiness. It's incomprehensible. Once we enter into Bria, now we have the concept of creation, the concept of a thing. But it's a thing without any definition yet, without any form yet. Right? It's not really a created thing yet, it's just no longer nothing. All it is is the potential to be a being, but without any form whatsoever. So still a very rarefied spiritual world, and yet our soul exists in that world. And that world encounters us, for those of you who've learned the Kabbalah, as the Chokhmah potential within our own soul. Right? When you have that spark of realizing something for the first time, or answering a question for the first time, and you have that aha, and the light bulb goes off at that very moment of chick, there's a spark, and you don't understand what it is, right? It's incomprehensible, but you know the answer's there. And only seconds later does it emerge with some details. Oh, right, I have to do this, the answer is that. That's because that first spark comes from that level of our soul that's in Bria, right? And that's the way we access what's above Bria, is we have to have this portal of this incomprehensible spark that allow us just get a glimpse into that whole world that is above our comprehension. Now where does this spark come from? Comes from uh, higher levels of our soul. Comes from, uh, comes from uh, what's called uh, uh, Keter, right? Comes from the super conscious parts of our soul, right? My conscious part of my soul that is like, I, I feel it as thought and emotion and action, etc. right? That's all conscious, but the, the biggest part of my soul is above that and it's always, pushing and swirling and reacting just like I am, right? I'm just not aware of it. And every so often, 
during the day, beep, 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 I get these sparks, and it's coming from the biggest part of my soul that, that's highest up. Right? So we want, part of this is learning how to start to navigate that chokhmah spark and fish in the superconscious uh, with more variety, more beautifully, and catch fish that'll be more delicious to eat in our days. Yeah. All right, next world, Yitzira. Suddenly he's very brief. All right, I don't know why this one is so, is so short. Yeah? But Yitzira is now a world where that, all a being is, is the potential to be something. Right? It hasn't really been created yet. It's just not nothing. Now in Yitzira, it starts to develop form. Right? So if you can imagine form without any substance whatsoever, right? like the blueprint of a building before you bought the materials for the building. Right? Yeah, you got a piece of paper. I know it's physically on something, but it, it could just be digital. It could not even be on paper. Right? The form is still there, and all it is is just some zeros and ones. It, it doesn't really have any physical substance that we would recognize, right? But that's the form, and it can become a whole building. So that's what happens in Yitzira is any being, including a human, including a book, including a fish, including a, a rock, it develops its form in that world, it may not express that level, the way we express that level, but that's where it develops its form. Is this thing going to be big or small? Is it going to be light or heavy? Is it going to, is it going to be able to move or not move? Is it going to, uh, what, what, what have you? Will it be air? Will it be solid? That's where the form develops, but still no substance on the form. And finally, I see a... So some people think the world of Asiya, that's the physical world, right? But the world of Asiya is a spiritual world, at the bottom of which pops out <coughs> the actual universe, right? So way down here is physical universe that's being created at every moment, as we learned in the last text. But above that, there's still a spiritual world, that's the world of Asiya, and that's where the spiritual matter of a substance takes shape. So it's no longer just form. Now it has spiritual substance, and, and what you would think of maybe a, as a soul if you pictured it, or the soul of a rock if you pictured it, or the soul of a tree if you pictured it, because everything in Kabbalah has a soul, that has its spiritual substance, whatever that is. It's still not physical, obviously. But that now is a, a being just about ready to become a physical being, and at the bottom, that's where the physical universe emerges. So since we're going through a user's guide for the soul, and as we said, these first chapters through chapter 8, this is all the information, this is what things do, the structure of things, very important for us to uh, take this in and understand that our soul, in its complexity, exists in these four spiritual worlds. And this is real good information to uh, remember and to bring into yourself what each of these worlds does, because the nature of the world that your soul is flowing through has to do with what that, how that's, that aspect of my soul uh, manifests in my consciousness. Right, so if I want to understand how my soul can flow better through consciousness, it's good to know, oh yeah, that's the Bria aspect of my soul. I, can, I don't even understand it, right? But I, I get it enters into consciousness like a spark. Yitzira, oh, okay, those are uh, emotions, you know. We should say Bria actually manifests as intellect. I was going out about Chochmah. But the world of Bria, any intellectual flow comes from Bria as well. So that's the main definition of the world of Bria is it's a world of intellect. Yitzira is a world of emotion, right? Now we're talking from our soul powers perspective. And Asiya is called the world of action, but it's a spiritual world. It's not a physical world. So on the one hand, we have these worlds and how they flow cosmically. On the other hand, we have how they manifest in our souls as intellect, emotion, and action. And learning how to, uh, learning how to uh, articulate my soul more masterfully, uh, it's good to know what worlds the soul is flowing through.
Any questions about the worlds? <laughs> All questions, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. There's an aspect of me that's an animal. Right. This body's an animal, and, and it wants to survive. It, well, you know, right. this exactly. is this is a good move. This is a bad move. Right. It's not about helping somebody else. But if I'm nice to this person, they'll be nice to me. That's nefesh pamit. Right. And um, what makes us special is that we are not like animals when we're above, and that's the nefesh pamit. Yes. Both of them travel in those worlds. Yes. Now there's another difference though, because nefesh pamit also has intellect, right? So, yes, yes. so a turtle. A turtle is going to go by instinct. Our nefesh pamit has intellect, but it uses the intellect for this, right? Okay, I want, I want food. I'm not a wolf that's just going to run out and hunt. I'm not, I'm not a, a worm that's going to go through and find its food. I'm a human, so now nefesh pamit says, okay, intellect, figure out how to get food. Oh, I'll, I'll go, I'll become a lawyer. I'll go and become a doctor. I'll go and become this. I'll get money. I have money in the bank. I'll have somebody buy food for me, and I'll sit and I'll eat, right? So intellect is there for Nefesh Bamit to be able to use for self-centered purposes. Nefesh Bamit is not going to go and say, let me figure out how to help somebody else. Let me figure out how to become other-centered. Let me figure out how to, uh, you know, nullify my ego. Nefesh Bamit is your Nefesh It's both. No, no. Nefesh Bamit and Nefesh Elakit both have emotions, intellect available. All there, yeah. To be able to be present on all levels. Both of them are present on all levels. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nefesh Bamit is, is as smart as we are. It's mostly us, right? So when, when, uh, when we find ourselves really, you know, very elaborately working something out, and we sit down and we look at it and we say, this whole thing was there just so that I could get back at this person, just so that I could, you know, get that piece of cake, just like so could ever, that's Nefesh Bamit thinking. Nefesh Bamit is a being, it's a soul with intellect, right? So it's, it's, it's humanity. So it's different from the animal kingdom in that we have free will, we have, we have intellectual thought, uh, seemingly more than, than almost any animal. Because yeah. Because yeah. How many for time? I still a little more. Good. Does the Torah come from uh, the Torah? What? So different levels of the Torah. It's a good question. Different levels of the Torah uh, flow on different levels of the worlds, right? So, for instance, um, let me get this right. If you, look at, if you look at the Talmud, um, actual uh, uh, Gemara in the Talmud comes from Bria because that is the thought process of God figuring things out in the Torah, right? Th there's a law that says this is kosher, this isn't kosher. And then all the discussions about why and hold this opinion and that and what about this, this, all the details, that's the reasoning behind the law. And so that flows down to Bria and Gemara mainly flows in Bria, right? Uh, uh, Mishnah, that's just very, very cut and dry. Okay, this is this is this is allowed. This isn't allowed. That's just God's final emotion, right? God's thought things through, and now God says, "Okay, figured it out. Good idea, right?" And it's just simple. Why is it a good idea? I don't know. Read read <laughs> read the Gemara, right? I just know it feels like it's a good idea, right? This bad idea, right? Don't don't kill. Don't murder. Rather, don't don't eat this bad idea. Why is it a bad idea? Talk to the Gemara. So the Mishnah is flowing in Yitzhira, right? And uh, I think you say just, just study halacha, pure laws, like Shulchan Aruch, that goes all the way down to Asiya. And Kabbalah, right, that's, that's up in the higher realms, right? That only flows in, uh, in, uh, in Atzilus, right? So the Torah, as it is in Pardes, in the four levels, it, it actually corresponds to these four worlds. It corresponds to the four letters of God's name. It's all, it's all part of the same structure, for sure. Nice question. If you didn't hear, the question was, does the Torah flow through the four worlds in some corresponding way? Yeah, so together... Together these worlds form the Seder Hishtal Okay, that's a big term, so get used to saying that. Seder Hishtal Shalut. Yeah? The chain-like order of descent so designated because this is the lowest link in the chain is connected to the highest by means of Level 
So this is not for separate distinct worlds and you're living in one and never mind the others. This is a flow. This is a constant flow. And each world is emerging from the world above it. So it's called Seder Hishtal Shalut. It's a, a, like a chain link development where one, each world is its own link, but it's like looped up in the link above it and connected to it. And when one pulls up, it pulls the others up. When one pulls down, it pulls the others down. It all flows one or the other. It's, it's a form of cause and effect, as it were. Right? So all these worlds form one flow from the Ein Sof, and it's constantly hiding and masking itself and making itself more and more coarse, less light and more substance, even on a spiritual level, until finally we have our world, which emerges at the very bottom of all of existence. In the course of its descent, Chokhmah ila. Eternal wisdom of the highest being paid for this. The physical body, the soul passes through the entire Seder Hishtah Shalut. And as stated earlier, this descent produces the various levels of souls, just as gestation causes the drop of semen to be transformed into the child's bodily organs, even to the point where it is formed into males. So until now, we were talking about this mashal, this example of the soul developing. And we're talking in generalized terms. Now we have a bit of a clearer picture of the structure of the four worlds and how the soul flows through it. And it's very, very useful, you'll find, when we get to the chapters where we start applying this. Okay, what do I do now to uh, flow differently, to improve my thought, speech, and action? How do I start to take that walk upwards that we talk about and, and, and develop from whatever point I'm at now? Right, so the, the, the soul as it is uh, developing, is actually flowing through these four worlds, and it pops out at a particular world, right? And there's a, let me, let me finish with a, a, a piece that helps explain, perhaps, for someone like me, what it's like if you're somebody that's a soul that's, that's functioning in a, from a higher level, right? Because for me, the world is physical. That's, that's what I deal with. I can still do wonderful things. I can, I can do my part in the world. I need to do my part in the world. But here I am. I live in the physical world. But some souls just kind of pass through that, right? They gestate only till one of these worlds, a real big tzaddik, like Moses, will just still be in Atsilas. And they basically pop out there, right? But wait, they still have a physical body. Moses still walked around and did stuff, right? So there's a concept of passing through, ma'avir, passing through. And you can understand it, that when I'm writing something, my mind and my brain is just passing through my hand. Right? I could write the most profound concept I could possibly think of. I could be studying complex physics. I could be writing a, a big, you know, Dvar Torah about some spiritual concept. I'm pushing myself to my limits. Does my brain have to explain to my hand what the concept is for the hand to write it? Does it have to say that, okay, now, now this idea, well, you're not going to understand it because you're hand, so let me put it this way, right? you got five fingers, right? And start making, no. The brain just passes right through the hand. The brain is writing the idea on the paper. And the hand doesn't need to understand at all what it's writing, right? The hand doesn't even have to understand it on its level. It doesn't even know what's going on. But still, the brain is passing through it, and the hand is writing. And you can effortlessly do that. We all, if we're healthy, do that. So some souls the great Sadiqim of each generation, the, the heads of those generations, as we're describing, they're still in a body, but their soul is just passing through the body. So there's a physical body, and the body is, is doing things in the world just like you and I are doing, but rather than being the consciousness of the hand, which I, I don't know why, I'm just doing this stuff in the world, I don't know what it's about, you know, I don't know the bigger picture, they're still the consciousness of the brain. And they're just passing through every aspect of their physical body. So I look at them and I see a physical body like mine. But they're just a soul, still a soul in Atsilus even, right? So not even, not even a soul with any self-identity whatsoever. They, they have no ego. They don't even know what, what, what an ego is. They, they, you know, they couldn't imagine it. Still, they have this body they're walking around in, but they're just passing through, right? And they can write beautifully in this world. They can share ideas. They can elevate people because the soul is the one that's speaking. And the soul still knows that it's a piece of God. It's still bound up with its source. And when we heard about Moshe, we said God spoke from Moshe's mouth, right? God said this first commandment, and we all died. And God spoke again, and we all died. We said, enough of that! Let Moshe say it. God said, okay. 
Moshe is going to speak, but it's me speaking from Moshe's mouth. Because Moshe's soul was still in Tzulus. Moshe didn't have a Moshe. And so when God was speaking the rest of the Ten Commandments, Moshe was a soul in Tzulus. And yeah, Moshe had a throat and a mouth, but it was just passing through. And what we heard from Moshe was actually still Moshe as a spark in Tzulus, as the head of the body. At that moment, we were all, oh yeah, <laughs> right? When you're after a good workout, right? Or a good, a good whatever class, and your body feels vitalized, and you're, you're just part of one whole, like, we feel great, that's amazing. That's how we felt. We all knew we were part of this one being, and that was, that was the consciousness, that was the peak of the consciousness speaking, but that was us too. We were all bound up in that oneness. I know, I know, yeah. We're always going to, so from Moshe's sins, <laughs> So every, every being has to progress, even Moshe. So Moshe had sins, but from his sins, we wrote the Torah, right? From, from my mitzvahs, no one's writing a Torah. Also, so. wasn't him. Because it says, Okay, let's, 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 we'll continue the conversation after. I love it. Any questions? Come on up. What happened to Beautiful work today. God, you know, and Moshe when he married a Midianite. <laughs> right. We, we with us, nothing is nothing is cut and dry. His level was different. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can always find you can always find the other side, right? I mean, we don't deal in absolutes. Good stuff, everybody. Good confusion. Yeah. Yes, yes. Anybody who needs uh, anybody who needs the text, let's walk over. I'll get that for you.